So hello everyone um, and welcome to our webinar on how to reset your innovation priorities to reflect the new reality. This webinar will cover and build upon some of the ideas that uh, Dave and I have been writing about in our recent ebook of the same name. Now, for those of you who don't know Innosight, we are a growth strategy consulting firm that was founded 20 years ago by our colleagues, Mark Johnson and the late great Harvard Business School professor, Clayton Christensen. Our mission is to empower forward thinking organizations to navigate disruptive change and own the future. Now today we're going to talk about uh, innovation. Uh, innovation has always been important, uh, but since COVID-19, one of the most urgent questions that we are hearing companies ask is, to what extent has COVID-19 changed where and how much we should be investing in innovation? Now back in early 2020, it seems a long time ago, uh, pre-COVID-19, you all may have had a good set of strategies, uh, a number of smart initiatives, but now COVID-19 has changed many of those priorities. So strategies are evolving and the companies we're talking to are increasingly finding that their innovation portfolios are out of sync and there is an urgent need to reset those innovation portfolios. So in this webinar, we're going to share a powerful approach for how you can make sure that you are doing the right kinds and the right amounts of innovation. Uh, my name is Alistair Trotter, um, and I'll be your MC for this webinar. Uh, I've been a part of the Innosight team since 2006, and I co-lead our uh, financial services and innovation performance practice areas with my awesomely talented uh, colleague, Dave Duncan, with whom I had the pleasure of co-authoring the recent series of eBooks on innovation performance, um, and who will be co-hosting uh, the webinar with me today. Uh, Dave, do you want to take a moment to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Thanks, Alistair. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Duncan. I'm a senior partner at Insight. I've been with the firm for about 15 years. I work a lot with Alistair on this topic of uh, innovation performance, and I'm very happy to be here today. I look forward to engaging with you. Thank you, Dave. So uh, before we begin, let me cover a few housekeeping notes. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and we will make uh, a link to the recorded webinar available uh, by email to you all afterwards and we will share the presentation slides that we're using today. Uh, we have muted all of the participant lines. Um, there are three ways to contact us during, uh, or interact with us during the presentation. Um, there, if you have questions, please submit them using the Q&A function. Uh, we will not be able to monitor the chat uh, in great detail. So if you have questions, put them into the Q&A function and we will set aside time at the end of the webinar to address questions. We also have a couple of polls we're gonna conduct during the course of the webinar. For that, we will use the inbuilt functionality inside Zoom. You'll see it pop up in your screen. And once you've voted, please just make sure to hit the submit button. So to set the context for how we think about innovation portfolio management, let's take a step back. Uh, and I'd like to invite Dave to share how Innosight thinks about corporate innovation in general. And specifically, Dave, what does it take to really drive innovation performance? Great. Thanks, Alistair. So uh, as Alistair mentioned, our goal today is to share what we've learned about how leaders can uh, use what we call strategic portfolio reviews to reassess and reset their, their priorities for innovation and importantly, where they're investing their innovation dollars. This is uh, an important thing to do in normal times, as Alistair said, but it's especially important now with co the COVID-19 pan pandemic, which has upended strategies and priorities of just about every organization. So that's the main focus today. Before we get there, we wanted to briefly take a step back and put that discussion in the broader context of the challenges that uh, organizations have getting results from innovation in general and how we think about uh, what needs to be in place to overcome those challenges and then where do strategic portfolio reviews fit in there. Um, a story from a global bank that uh, Alistair and I worked with about 10 years ago uh, illustrates these challenges well. Uh, at the time, the CEO of this bank had committed publicly to innovation as a strategic priority and launched a big uh, internal initiative. A centerpiece of that was the launch of a company-wide ideation campaign that engaged thousands of employees in spontaneous idea generation, shaping, evaluation. There was a very expensive piece of idea management software they invested in to facilitate that. 
And everyone was quite energized by the effort when it kicked off. Employees were excited that they'd have the opportunity to contribute their ideas. Leaders were optimistic it would lead to new ideas for growth and also uh, probably even more importantly, stimulate uh, what they call the vibrant culture of innovation. So fast forward one year after that uh, campaign, not a single one of those ideas had been implemented and the culture, instead of being more engaged in innovation was actually more cynical about it. So what went wrong? Well, we worked with them uh, to do a little bit of a post-mortem on that uh, effort and we discovered a few things. The first was that uh, when they launched the campaign, it wasn't clear what the strategic priorities were for innovation, right? Were they looking to get innovative ideas to drive uh, more innovative products, better cons consumer experiences? Were they looking for ideas for entirely new uh, growth businesses? And so because they hadn't clarified that, uh, they got ideas that were all over the map. And then there wasn't a way that had been established to evaluate them and prioritize the ones that were most aligned with those strategic priorities, right? So that was one challenge. Um, another challenge, and this is uh, uh, one of the biggest ones and it relates to the topic today, related to resource allocation. So they had uh, surfaced all of these ideas, but they hadn't thought through, okay, once we prioritize ideas, if we're able to do that, how are we gonna fund them? And who's gonna work on them? And importantly, since we don't have a lot of people and money sitting around doing nothing, what are we gonna stop doing so that we can put them on these new ideas that have been surfaced? So things just kind of hit a brick wall um, after ideas were generated. And we see this kind of thing all the time with corporate initiatives that are intended to drive innovation. So there's kind of a standard menu of things that we see companies do. They might uh, have a campaign like this or a hackathon. They might set up a corporate venture capital group. They might um, establish an incubator to explore and, and uh, incubate new disruptive growth businesses. Um, or they might, you know, uh, uh, hire a chief innovation officer whose job is to somehow stimulate in innovation in the organization. And the problem is not that any of these things are intrinsically bad ideas. In fact, they can all play important roles. We've seen examples of them working well. The problems arise when they're implemented without a full consideration of the broader system of enablers that need to be in place for any of these individual initiatives to be successful. And put more succinctly, Building an innovation capability that drives performance is a systems design challenge. And if instead you try to build it by cobbling together these types of isolated point solutions, they're all gonna fail with nearly 100% certainty in entirely predictable ways. So uh, that's just a general uh, uh, guiding principle we have about what it takes to uh, enable innovation. I'm sure that seems plausible uh, to many of you, but but so what, all right? So what, what can you do about that? Well, the first thing you need is a way to understand what are all the components of a complete well-functioning innovation system. And we at NSI have developed a model for how we think about uh, answering that question. Uh, it's been developed over the past 20 years. It's very useful as a way to uh, understand and map out how innovation happens in an organization today. Uh, highlight what's working well, what are some of the challenges, and it's also useful as a design tool for um, uh, strengthening uh, your innovation uh, capabilities. We're going to do a whole webinar on that in about a month. Um, right now, I'm just going to spend probably 30 seconds giving a quick overview to explain, you know, frame our conversation on portfolio management. So the model has five components, and it's illustrated by this uh, picture here on the right. Uh, we sometimes refer to it internally as the 5P model, which the astute listener will be able to um, uh, determine why we call it that. And at the center of the model is innovation performance. And that reflects the fact that innovation is always a means to an end. And the first thing you need to be clear about when you're uh, intentionally designing an innovation system is what are the business outcomes that we are innovating towards? Are we trying to drive growth? If it's growth, is it organic growth versus inorganic growth? Um, are we trying to change the mix of businesses we're in to drive our, our valuation multiple or to, 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 to have new growth platforms? Are we trying to become more inefficient and innovate the way we do things? Um, are we trying to uh, improve our brand image externally uh, with the world or internally with our employees to be a more attractive place for, for people to work? 
So the first step in designing your system is to be very clear about what those business outcomes are, because that'll define performance outcomes against which you're going to evaluate the efficacy of your system. Right? And then once you've done that, there's four components to the system itself. The first is clear innovation priorities. Um, and and th th these are uh, the answers to questions like, well, what types of innovation do we need to do to reach those business outcomes? And where are we going to focus our efforts from a strategic perspective? These are a function not just of those outcomes, but also of what your strategy is, your industry position, the current environment, what's happening in the world. And um, this is one of the areas where we see most often gaps that uh, lead to problems with uh, innovation performance is a lack of real sharp clarity on what the priorities are for innovation that you're gonna, that are then gonna guide all of your uh, efforts. Once you've established your priorities, the next thing you need is what we call innovation pathways. These are all of the mechanisms in an organization that actually do the innovation and make it happen, right? All the way from how you identify initial ideas and develop them, test them, scale them. A lot of those things that I alluded to earlier, uh, like you know, incubators, uh, VC funds, um, you know, innovation processes. These are typically the kinds of things you see in this category of innovation pathways. And it's important to define those and have those align neatly with your priorities. The third component of the uh, model is managed innovation portfolios. Um, here, uh, what we're getting at is that um, what an organization needs is a way to look at the aggregate set of innovation activity it has going on and assess if that's um, uh, meeting the performance outcomes they've established. And importantly, to be able to allocate resources across those different innovation types, different innovation projects in different parts of the company. That's the role of the portfolio, uh, managed innovation portfolio component of the model. And then finally, of course, you need people. Uh, you need uh, people in the right roles with the right skills, doing the right things. You need leaders doing the right things. Each of these five components has a number of things uh, below it that we use uh, as we are diagnosing and uh, designing innovation systems. And they all need to be in place to some degree and integrated with one another uh, to actually get to the outcomes you want to achieve. So we're going to focus on the one in the lower right uh, because in some ways it's the glue that holds all of this together and that enables you to evaluate the efficacy of your system. And uh, so with that as a framing introduction, I'll turn it back over to Alistair. Thank you, Dave. <clears throat> so let's dive into this uh, corner quadrant of innovation portfolio management, which is really about linking, uh, the, as Dave said, the aggregate set of innovation activity in the organization and ensuring that it is aligned with your priorities and poised or positioned to deliver against the required performance criteria. So the purpose of innovation portfolio management is to enable you to answer three questions and to ensure that the answers to those questions drive resource allocation and in turn innovation performance. So let me touch on each of the three questions. One, are we doing the right amount of innovation, right? Too much, too little, or the right amount? Two, are we doing the right kinds of innovation? And three, have we optimized how resources are allocated to innovation? Now, now we've introduced these three questions, we'd love to do a quick poll with you all. And, and what we'd like to understand is, which of these three questions does your organization find it hardest to answer? So let me kick off the polling here. All right, good, we've got about 30% of the votes in already. Uh, interesting. So we're seeing actually very slightly different uh, results here, Dave, than I would have expected. I'm going to give this another 10 seconds here before I close out the poll. All right, let me end the polling here now. Uh, and I'll just share the results with you all so you can see what, uh, what Dave and I are seeing. So we have about 45% uh, of people um, saying that uh, identifying whether or not we're doing the right types of innovation. So the balance between you know, core adjacent disruptive, uh, which customers are we going after? What are the big imperatives? Um, I, had a, I had a hunch we were gonna see question three be challenging. Uh, I think perhaps in pre-COVID times, a lot of people would talk about the ROI and innovation efforts, and this was a real focus. Um, Dave, curious, any thoughts when you see the results here? <laughs> 
Uh, well, I'm not entirely surprised that uh, all three questions are, are hard to answer. Uh, that's typical. And just given the, the magnitude of changes happening in the world today, that middle question about the right kinds of innovation uh, does seem to be the most urgent, uh, given how much everybody's uh, priorities are likely changing. Good. Well, we're certainly going to touch on uh, ways to answer that question um, and then take action in response to uh, the insights generated. Let me uh, close down the polling here. All right. So uh, to answer you know, these three questions requires that you prepare for and conduct what we call a strategic portfolio review. And there are four steps for doing that. First, you have to define the portfolio of interest. You have to figure out what's in, what's out, um, and what you choose to consider as in scope for the portfolio review will really depend on whether this is you know, a strategic analysis to assess long-term growth, or whether this is an exercise focused on identifying projects to cut in order to free up funding. So this is the first step, figure out what's in and what's out. Secondly, you have to clarify the performance goals for that portfolio. Again, this depends on the context for the analysis. If your portfolio is focused on long-term growth, then it's likely that the primary performance goal is going to be say 2025 revenues or something similar. But if your portfolio analysis is more focused on pruning the portfolio, then there may be a more nuanced set of performance goals around, say, maximizing revenue given a fixed amount of investment or even a target investment to be cut without doing too much da uh, damage to the top line revenue opportunities. The third step is you have to construct what we call portfolio views, which allow you to generate insights. Portfolio views are really just different ways of looking at your portfolio that, you, that will yield insights into where there are issues or opportunities. And we're going to explore a series of portfolio views uh, over the course of the next 20 minutes or so. And then finally, you have to use those insights to make decisions. Without leaders making decisions and taking actions to move resources around in response to these insights, this exercise will become nothing more than an interesting discussion. The power of the strategic portfolio review and of portfolio management lies in linking the insights from the portfolio views with resource allocation and strategy decisions. So we'll now illustrate these steps by sharing some stories from real life strategic portfolio reviews uh, that Dave and I have helped leadership teams to conduct. So let's first explore question one. Are we doing too much, too little, or the right amount of innovation? Now, before I share the first portfolio view, let me set some context. Uh, a couple of years ago, Dave and I were asked to lead a series of portfolio reviews for the largest business units inside a global financial services organization. Uh, this was a, a complex organization, multiple business units, multiple geographies, matrix structure. And as a result, there were hundreds of projects uh, inside the organization, which were you know, driving top line growth. Um, and many of these were actually invisible to the senior most leaders of the organization. So for this client, the portfolio of interest in this case was what they described as needle movers, projects that are really going to drive meaningful growth over the next five years for one of the major business units. Now the performance goals as a result for this portfolio were uh, understandably focused on revenue generation and in particular identifying new sources of revenue given that the core business uh, for this business unit was one where leaders were increasingly concerned about slowing growth. In fact, this business unit for whom we did the uh, portfolio review had established a very clear revenue target for 2025. And even more importantly, they had a specific revenue target that they wanted their innovation portfolio to deliver against. Now you'll note that to definitively answer the question, are we investing enough in innovation, actually requires you to first answer the question, how much growth do we need from innovation? And in the case example we're using that we just shared, the client had already developed a point of view on the answer to that question. They knew exactly how much revenue growth they were demanding from their innovation portfolio by 2025. Now, we're not gonna dive deeply into how they determined the answer to that question in this webinar, 
but it is a really important question to ask and answer, and we will address it in the upcoming ebook and webinar topic on innovation priorities. So let me show you the portfolio view. Now, there's a lot going on here, so let me just walk you through what we're seeing here. Each bubble on this chart represents a single project. And for those who are counting, there are 25 projects included in this analysis. Now, the size of each bubble represents the risk-adjusted steady-state revenue in 2025, right? This is basically the project team's assessment of what the revenues could be using art of the possible thinking. And it's very important to note that these are not financial projections or numbers that the team wanted to be held accountable for hitting. The vertical axis here shows the total addressable markets, which we've clustered for simplicity into four tiers of increasing market size. And then finally, along the horizontal axis, uh, we have the time to market. This is, again, what the innovation team working on each project believed uh, about when they could be in market and generating initial revenues. So just to put this all together, let's take an example. We'll pick uh, Project X sitting here right in the center at the top. This is an important project for the business unit. It's 18 months from being in market, and it's not only going after a huge addressable market as evidenced by its high height on the y-axis, but it's also expected to generate some pretty significant revenues despite the fact that we've risk adjusted those revenues to reflect the fact that this project is still in development. So we put this chart in front of the senior most leadership team, including the CEO of the business unit, and well, let's talk about the observations they made and the actions they took. First, they realized there were four projects, which were still more than two years pre-launch, which despite going after large markets, the teams were not asserting that they were gonna generate large revenues. So they immediately kicked off a project review, assigning one sponsor from the executive team to dig into the team's assumptions to determine whether the project was in fact worth continued investment. Second, they realized there was another set of projects that were not going after large enough markets. Even if these projects were successful, they just didn't have the potential to be needle movers for the business's overall revenue trajectory. I'm sure they might generate 10, maybe $20 million once scaled, but for a billion dollar business looking at a potential threat to its core, these were not the type of growth opportunities that were a priority. So in response, they immediately placed a subset of these projects into review, ultimately killing a number of those initiatives. Third, they realized they now had a hole to fill in terms of big projects that would really move the needle for top line growth two or three years into the future they realized that if you added up all the bubbles on this portfolio view, there was still not enough in the pipeline to meet their 2025 aspiration. So they agreed to kick off a strategic initiative with CEO sponsorship to identify a set of longer term initiatives that they could pursue that would find large attractive markets and drive the necessary revenues to achieve their 2025 aspirations. Now, we just showed you one portfolio view, which can help answer the question of whether or not you're doing enough innovation. There are many others that could help dig into it. But what I would like to do is just share a few of the common patterns that we see with that type of a portfolio view to help illustrate how we think about interpreting a slide like that. The first is what we call the Hail Mary, um, in which you tend to see one or two very large projects uh, which aren't expected to contribute revenue for a few years. We see this quite a lot in organizations which are facing disruption for the first time in many years, and when they might underestimate the risk of failure of a major or transformative project. Now, the obvious fix here is to quickly spin up a portfolio of initiatives focused on growth, ideally with a blend of riskier, higher reward projects, as well as uh, some that might deliver revenues in the short to midterm. The second pattern that we see, uh, we call the incrementalist. Uh, here you see a large number of small to medium sized initiatives, but the portfolio lacks any projects that would really move the needle for the business. Uh, this is a common pattern in organizations which have been consistently able to deliver steady growth in the past. And the pattern is not concerning in and of itself, so long as there are no impending threats to the ability of the core business to sustain current growth rates. 
And so the fix here, if it should be required, is once again to seek out and identify new initiatives that look for greater impact, even if that pushes, and sometimes because it pushes, the organization to explore adjacencies where it might not have looked before. The third pattern is the unfocused portfolio, characterized by uh, the struggle that a leadership team faces to narrow down the pool of interesting projects into the subset that really matters. This pattern is common in very large organizations, um, organizations where uh, there's a high degree of autonomy for PL leaders, um, as well as in organizations where there is just so much opportunity that it's genuinely hard to whittle down the set of opportunities and make decisions about where to focus. To address this, it's really important to revisit the strategic context for example, long-term revenue growth, and engage in the right leadership discussions to really drill down into where the business wants to be in five years, and then identify the most compelling opportunities that are not only large, but also create option value for the company. I'd say focus is really the, the key word here. So these are, these are three common uh, patterns we see. There are certainly other types of charts we use to assess efficiency. Um, Dave, you know, you've done a lot of these conversations with me over the years. Any, any tips you'd share with the group? Yeah, you know, maybe I'll, I'll answer that by answering one of the questions that came into the chat. So, uh, or the Q&A, one, one question is what layer or layers in the corporate hierarchy are you governing portfolios and conducting portfolio reviews? Is it at the corporate level, the BU level, the, the, the product line level? Uh, and that's a great question. Uh, now, what we're talking about here is not a comprehensive, you know, project review of every single project you have going on in the organization. This is really a strategic portfolio review that's oriented towards enabling the leadership teams to make strategic resource allocation decisions. And so it's typically at the level of a BU leadership team, maybe a regional leadership team, or a corporate, uh, you know, the overall corporate level leadership team. Now it turns out that um, some of these same views that we're sharing, and there's maybe 20 of them that we commonly use, we're only gonna share a few of them today, um, are pretty useful at, for product line leaders and you know uh, further down the organization with smaller portfolios just because it gives them um, useful ways to see the big picture and therefore make decisions about individual projects with the big picture in mind. But um, the, the, for a strategic portfolio review, you're really um, looking at the portfolio of the stuff that really matters for achieving your strategy. And it's typically the leadership team that's reviewing that. Um, the other, uh, I guess, just comment I'd make about this is that um, when, you're, when you're making these, uh, developing these views and getting insights out of them and having a leadership conversation around them, um, the views themselves don't tell you exactly what you should do, right? It's not a mechanical algorithmic like, oh, we've got four projects in this example and they're too small, we should just immediately kill all of them. Rather, they're to enable you to have a discussion about what you ought to do, and as Alar Alistair uh, relayed in the story he just tell, told, um, they killed some things, but in other cases they wanted to revisit them and say, well, you know, maybe we don't have the, uh, great data about this. Maybe we need to rethink what the market is or how big it is. And so they, they lead you to take action um, through a discussion. Uh, they don't necessarily just tell you what you should uh, uh, kill and continue and so on. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good questions coming in. So let's now explore the second question that leadership teams need to ask of their innovation portfolios. Are we doing the right kinds of innovation? So before we show you the second portfolio view, let's briefly discuss what we mean by the right kinds of innovation. As Dave mentioned earlier in the discussion, innovation is always a means to an end. So doing the right kinds of innovation means your innovation investments ought to support clear strategic priorities. For example, our priorities might be to innovate uh, the customer experience or to increase productivity, perhaps develop new business models to create new sources of revenue. In recent months, we've seen companies establish priorities around the low touch economy as a result of COVID-19. These are all examples of strategic priorities against which you might want to align your portfolio. Now, we'll talk a lot more about how we think about establishing those types of priorities. Uh, in the upcoming ebook on innovation priorities. And there we'll get into you know, how you make them customer focused, grounded in the future, and provide the right amount of focus for a team without provide too, too much constraint. 
Um, but for now, let's talk about another type of innovation, which could also be the balance of risk, right? So uh, we often hear questions about the balance of core, adjacent, and transformative. And we think of these as another manifestation of the type of innovation. Now, there are strategic reasons for wanting a blend of all different types of innovation. Um, and the ratio of each should be a deliberate choice for any company and something that can be tracked over time to ensure that your portfolio is aligned with your intent. So let's dive into the portfolio view that we sometimes use here. Now, this portfolio view is actually one of a series prepared for uh, a multinational software company. And for them, the relevant question was, is our portfolio aligned with our strategic imperatives given where the world is heading? They had defined recently a set of strategic priorities, but they had brilliant people, PhDs, scientists, engineers, who were all working in a variety of innovation labs, innovation centers, uh, even in the business units. And they were always coming up with interesting new ideas. Now the leadership team here was worried that projects were emerging, being worked on and funded, which were inconsistent with or a distraction from the long-term priorities of the leadership team. So for this portfolio view, the portfolio includes all projects that have been worked on by at least one NCE for a duration of at least six months. That was their threshold for inclusion. And the performance goals were about ensuring a high level of consistency between the priorities and the portfolio investments. So let's take a look at the chart in more detail. On this chart, each rectangle represents one project in the portfolio, and the height of each box uh, represents the level of in-year investment in that project. Along the horizontal axis, we have the five strategic imperatives or strategic priorities that the organization had newly identified as being critical to driving long-term growth. Now, the boxes all stack together, so if you take a look at column A, uh, or right there on the left, you can see that the organization was investing nearly $75 million in projects which were aligned with this particular strategic imperative. So what happens when we put this portfolio view in front of the leadership team? First, they immediately realized that they were under-investing in two of their priorities, B and D, which triggered an immediate conversation about how they should free up funds to drive additional project volume there. Second, the team was intrigued by the set of four projects that weren't aligned against any priority. Now, two of those projects, the ones which are the brighter red, were actually in the same business unit. And that, that business unit had a lower growth rate than its peers. In fact, the team realized that that business unit needed to identify four transformational projects in order to drive growth over the long term. The team discussed quickly whether or not these projects had a unifying theme that might shed light on a potential new strategic priority, but they ultimately decided to defer that decision until the annual planning cycle. So once again, let's look at a couple of common patterns that we see with this type of a portfolio view. The first is the outside the box pattern, uh, in which you have a large number of initiatives which are outside of stated priorities. Uh, this is a common pattern in organizations which have seen or are, or perhaps are seeing a sudden change in strategy, whether that's driven by external factors like a pandemic or a significant move by a competitor um, or internal factors like the deployment of a new strategy. But the fix, as is probably not surprising, is to move quickly to identify the non-aligned projects and then make decisions about whether they should be shut down or whether they can in fact be repositioned in light of uh, new priorities. A second uh, common archetype or pattern that we see here um, is the all-in, where you see one imperative and its associated projects absorbing the lion's share of resources. Uh, so we tend to see this um, in organizations where there's been a relatively recent strategy change. Um, it often represents an oversteering of resources into a new imperative, but it can also be an indicator that the organization simply sees this imperative as a lot easier to pursue, uh, perhaps because there are existing customers, an existing channel, or a platform on which the organization is building. The fix here, if it is required, is simply to ensure that 
first comment uh, is that you know th this this illustrates really why we talk about a system that has these different components, right? The priorities, pathways, portfolios, and people. These portfolio views are part of your portfolio management system, right? A subsystem within the overall system, but it needs to be connected to the priorities subcomponent of your system. Those need to be clearly defined in order for any of these uh, views to be constructed and to make sense. And oftentimes when we do this with a, a leadership team for the first time, they find that they need to go back and do a little bit of work to sharpen maybe some subset of their priorities so they can they can do this this analysis. Um, the second comment I make is that, you know, this again reinforces what I said earlier that this is a these views are an enabler of a strategic discussion, right? They don't give you the answer. You might look at this chart on the right and say, gosh, why are we doing those four things in red that are not aligned with any stated strategic priority? It could mean that um, those are not a good use of, of your resources and you should put those resources on something else. Or it could mean that um, you know, the organization is responding to some exciting opportunity it senses in the market that's not on the radar in any strategic plan and maybe it should be. And so you know, that's the kind of conversation you have around it when you, when you look at views like this. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll say, and you know, I'll, I'll respond again to another question that came in, uh, re re which relates to this idea of, of uh, innovation types and are we doing the right kinds of innovation, which is how do you draw the line between sustaining incremental innovation and strategic or disruptive innovation before you start your portfolio analysis or is it assumed that these uh, these portfolio views are all about the more uh, strategic disruptive innovation opportunities. So the answer to the second question is no, not necessarily, right? It depends on, on what types of strategic questions you're trying to answer. And usually you're trying to figure out um, balance of all of your resources for innovation across all types. There's only one pot of resources to, to allocate from. And so if you're going to do more disruptive stuff, you're going to have to do less uh, sustaining stuff. And so it's useful to have the picture of them all together. Um, on the question of how do you draw the line, uh, so that's, that's a more involved um, uh, answer. But, you know, uh, typically uh, the, the difference, the, the, you know, there's a spectrum that we think about um, that starts with your core uh, business model, core products, um, and core innovation, right, where there's relatively few assumptions when you're doing that kind of innovation about um, the business model you're going to sell it through, the customer need whether the technology is going to work. There's a lot that you can be pretty certain of when you're pursuing that type of innovation. When you go to the other end of the spectrum and you're really uh, focusing on disruptive uh, ideas that maybe you have no precedent for and maybe there's no precedent for in the world, there are a lot more assumptions uh, underlying those intrinsically when you pursue them. Like you, you may have only an assumption about who the target customer is, what the problem is you're going to solve for them, what the business model is going to be the value proposition, the economic model, the regulatory environment. There can be all kinds of things that are uncertain. And the further, you know, uh, the more dimensions um, that are uncertain and the more uncertain it is, the more it's likely to be classifiable as a disruptive innovation or a more of a transformational opportunity. And that matters because you're going to pursue it uh, in a different way, right? Rather than through a deliberate um, methodical process, uh, sorry, deliberate uh, long-term planning process, you're probably gonna pursue it in a more iterative discovery driven process. And when we um, uh, work with companies on that exact issue, you can, you can develop a kind of a typing tool that enables you to ask a set of questions about a particular project and it will plot it you know, on that spectrum of uncertainty and assumptions and uh, give you a sense of, of where it lies and, and where you should treat it in the portfolio. Awesome, Dave, thank you. Um, let's take a look at the third and final question that leaders should ask of their portfolios. Have we optimized how resources are allocated to innovation? Now, uh, before we get into the next portfolio view, it's uh, time just to do another quick poll on one of the most common <coughs> challenges that companies have when it comes uh, to resource allocation and innovation, which is, how do you kill zombie projects? And for those of you who are not familiar with the term, despite my premature launching of the poll earlier, 
Um, a zombie project is one in which you know, it really should be dead by now, but for some reason the project is still alive, even though everyone thinks it should probably be put out of its misery. And these projects can limp on for months, even years, consuming resources, causing problems to morale, not to mention the opportunity cost associated with using resources that might be refocused on other higher value projects. So let me see if I can do this correctly this time. Uh, let me select the second poll question and launch the poll. Curious to see uh, where the participants fall on the spectrum here. I'm not gonna hazard a guess as I'm assuming uh, results last time were somewhat indicative of uh, uh, what we expect to see this time. So we've got about uh, half of the votes in already. I'll give it another 10 seconds and then close it out here and share the results with everybody. Okay, we're down just a few final votes trickling in. I'm pretty sure the results are not gonna change. So let me share the results here. Um, and this certainly reflects what we have seen uh, in the organizations we work with. Uh, it can be hard, uh, you know, hard and very hard together there, almost uh, just a shade over 65%, uh, to, you know, to kill zombie projects. And there are a number of reasons for why that's the case. Uh, I'm certainly happy to see that only 1%, well, professionally, I'm, the, I'm torn between that it's hard and easy. Um, Dave, curious if you have uh, thoughts here uh, based on what the group's sharing with us. Oh, uh, well, I just, I just saw a comment in the chat that um, it's much easier to kill them since the pandemic, right? So that, <laughs> I guess, uh, or not. I guess to the extent that there, there's a, um, uh, uh, anything good coming out of it, that it makes it easier to, to redirect your resources to things that are really <clears throat> important and strategic. Um, and I, I guess, yeah, I'm not surprised by the poor results. And, and there's a reason we call them zombies. They're <laughs> really hard to kill. Um, and, and for really rational reasons, you know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not uh, typically that anybody's doing anything um, uh, that, that isn't perfectly rational and aligned with their incentives. It's that the system isn't functioning to, uh, to highlight them and, and provide the opportunities to, uh, to kill them when that's appropriate. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. So let's uh, get back into this third question here. So our next portfolio view is a helpful way to identify zombie projects. This portfolio view is from a recent project with a, a global data and analytics service provider. So their portfolio uh, for the sake of this discussion um, included all in-flight projects that were consuming uh, greater than some threshold level of funding. And the relevant performance goal here was essentially the expected ROI on their innovation investments. So let me walk you through the view here. Each bubble represents one project. Uh, the size of each bubble is the budgeted in-year investment. Uh, on the horizontal axis here, um, let's say this is the stage of development of the innovation project. Um, people should recognize the language here as you go along, but uh, you know, projects in a well-run process uh, progress from stage to stage as they move from idea to impact. And then the vertical axis is the amount of time that a project has spent in the stage uh, which is currently in. So if we take a look at uh, project W, you can see that this is currently in the pilot phase and perhaps a little worryingly, it's been there for nearly two years. So um, let, uh, let's talk about the observations and decisions that the leadership team made when we put this in front of them. Well, for this particular portfolio view, there's really only one goal uh, and three projects jump out as being in what we would affectionately call the zombie zone. Now, of course, it's possible these projects and the teams were just taking their time, uh, but this particular leadership team felt that these three projects needed some special attention. Now, the executives were highly aware of these three projects, but when they saw this chart, they were surprised by how long they had spent in the most recent stage. They had previously perceived each project to be making good progress, but when pushed on exactly what good progress meant, the leadership team quickly realized that these project teams were likely going through the motions. They were building prototypes, running pilots, but they were not actually making meaningful advances towards critical milestones. In short, they were or were certainly close to becoming zombies. So to fix this, each project team was asked to define very clearly what would it take to get to the next stage in the innovation process? What were the assumptions that they would need to believe to be true for these opportunities to realize their potential at scale? And based on the team's answers to those questions, one project was shut down, 
and the other two were given very tight leashes and aggressive timelines in order to meaningfully advance to the next stage in the process. In some cases, drastically reducing the in-year investment to allow those teams to focus only on those activities required to advance to the next stage. So as with all our portfolio views, we're typically looking for a few things. Um, one of the common patterns we see, uh, we would uh, call World War Z, uh, where we see an infestation of the zombies. Again, uh, this is not uncommon. We actually see it most frequently in organizations which have just undergone a change in leadership. And a new leader or a new leadership team starts looking afresh at each project, making their own judgments on whether projects are attractive uh, or feasible. And this isn't a bad thing. It's uh, an effective way to clean house and bring execution in line with a new strategy. However, to ensure that a, a new team doesn't fall prey to any of the same biases as their predecessors, we find it helpful to encourage the development of ongoing portfolio reviews to ensure that no new zombies emerge. Uh, the second pattern we sometimes look for, uh, the classic zombie as it were, is uh, the friends in high places. Uh, here you often see one or two projects which are frequently fairly extreme zombies. Um, they've been around so long they started to blend in with the woodwork. <clears throat> We see this pattern in many organizations where there have been leaders in place for a few years or where there's a high degree of autonomy granted to those leaders and essentially certain pet projects get funding and protection often for good reasons uh, leaders believe they're protecting them from the broader system um, and uh, you know we are all for lone innovators and visionary leaders finding creative ways to get resources to their projects um, and we accept the necessity for leaders to sometimes play this role in some organizations but for the vast majority of organizations, these types of projects are actually far more likely to be a drain on resources than anything else. And so to address this, it just requires that leadership teams have an honest conversation about opportunity cost and be transparent about the level of investments against uh, an assessment of the risks that are involved. So uh, Dave, any, any thoughts here on uh, aligning uh, or optimizing resource allocation uh, with a portfolio? Now, just maybe a thought that uh, threads through all three of the, the questions and the examples you showed. So, you know, each of these views or, or other views that uh, are related to these three questions are going to surface things that may not be things you want to continue investing in, right? And that you may find things that are just not big enough that are being pursued either uh, they're going after markets that are too small or the um, what do you have to believe revenue projection is, is, is too, uh, too small. There could be things that are not aligned with strategy and that just, you know, are a distraction and you need to put those resources on things that are more strategic. Or in this case, um, you know, things that are um, sucking up resources and don't have much of a chance of success, which is the characteristic of a zombie. Um, you might you might find um, that it surfaces redundant investment, right? You've got two different groups in two different parts of the company that are pursuing the same thing, um, and and therefore you're you're kind of over investing in it. All of those things give you opportunity to prune your portfolio, and it's not uncommon when you do this for the first time to see as much as thirty, even forty percent of your investment dollars that are going to innovation, those big strategic projects, as being investment that you can redirect to more important innovation activities like it's usually um, it, 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 it's often that dramatic right that, that you see um, uh, some of the flaws in your current portfolio which is a, a very exciting thing because especially in current times uh, you know any way that you can free up resources to make sure they're focused on the most important strategic priorities uh, is a good thing thank you um, and so we've touched on this a, a couple of times, so I'm just going to flash up um, a busy uh, chart here. We've only had time in the hour we have with you to share three portfolio views. Um, as Dave mentioned, there's probably 20 or 30, uh, but we you know we wanted to put up the nine most commonly used. And I'm not planning to go into detail on each of these. Uh, we will make the slides available, but uh, there are lots of nuanced ways to slice and dice the portfolio to create interesting views to look at things based on um, you know, business unit cuts, uh, to look at, uh, particularly in uh, the optimization space, to look at capital investment, to look at the ratio of investment to market opportunity. You can look at where FTEs are spending time relative to market opportunity. And uh, the idea is to put the right set of views in front of a leadership team 
to allow them to have a productive discussion. Yeah, so, that's great. No, that's Dave, great. you want to talk us through uh, how we think about taking these questions and, and putting them into, uh, into action uh, over time inside an organization? Yeah, I'll just make a couple of final quick comments and then we can spend the rest of our time uh, answering some of the questions that have come in. Uh, in fact, uh, on this particular topic of uh, how you, you know, how do you move forward with this? Okay, how do you actually um, uh, action strategic portfolio reviews and not just once, but doing on an ongoing basis? Uh, this relates to a question that came in: Is it possible for innovation strategy system to be fused with the enterprise portfolio management systems, um, and can it be? Uh, uh, basically become part of your, your management system? And the answer is absolutely it can, and in our view it should. Um, and uh, you know, we've seen examples of people taking this type of a, of a process, strategic portfolio of use, these types of um, uh, analyses and insight generation techniques and integrating those into how they do strategic planning, how they do budgeting, um, how they do uh, become a standard kind of dashboard things that they look at in their quarterly business review. So it's certainly possible to integrate with the formal management mechanisms you already have in place. Um, but the last thing I would say, and maybe you can turn this to our last slide before we go to Q&A, um, uh, page, uh, uh, the next page, is that you don't have to do all of that, right? All of the, um, you know, changing the systems and the management systems to get a ton of value out of this, right? Just doing this once, right? And, and um, having, uh, you know, uh, defining a portfolio that you wanna, that, that comprises your strategic portfolio, being really clear about how you're evaluating that against what performance standards, developing these portfolio views, and then um, importantly, having a leadership conversation about the results that really drives decision-making um, doing that for a first time, as I said before, can often yield uh, a ton of value and enabling you to reset your portfolio pretty efficiently uh, before you even have to worry about, you know, integrating it with your, you know, your IT systems and your, your performance management systems at a more technical level. Anything else you want to add, Alistair, before we uh, just take a couple final questions? No, I think you covered everything, Dave. That's great. Great, great. Uh, well, we just have a few minutes left here, so I will have um, uh, been looking at some of the questions here. Alistair, one question we have, are there any examples you've seen recently of companies using this type of approach to adapt to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic? Um, yes, so I think there's a, a couple of different approaches. Um, I think, uh, you know, one, the first one we saw was actually with uh, the first case study example we talked about. So the global financial services firm, and uh, they had so many different projects in flight. Um, they already actually had a portfolio management system in place by the time COVID-19 came around. And what they wanted to know at the leadership team level was, um, what are we doing in response to COVID? And they wanted to be able to answer that, which is what are we doing for consumers? What are we doing for our business partners? Uh, they wanted to be able to cut it as to what are we doing that will uh, help people navigate uh, you know, the challenging environment, as well as what are we doing that might help us uh, drive, uh, you know, seize opportunities that are emerging as a result of the, the pandemic. And so they used their existing portfolio management uh, engine, uh, introduced a set of different priorities, uh, essentially aligned with each of those questions I just asked. And within a you know, small number of days, uh, weeks, they were able to aggregate up the answer to that question uh, for the leadership team so that they could go out to stakeholders, their constituents, uh, and communicate really clearly about the aggregate set of actions that the organization was taking. Whereas in many organizations, that would be a scrambling of uh, spreadsheet preparation. Um, and we've seen similar approaches in a, a couple of other organizations where they had um, you know, very important new imperatives that came out, usually around this low touch economy. Um, and they needed to quickly communicate out that message from strategy, but then they wanted to uh, create the, the feedback loop that would force leaders in the organization to respond and share what they were doing so that they could aggregate and coordinate their response at the enterprise level. Um, so we've seen this approach being used to, to serve both those ends. Great, thanks. 
Um, why, don't, why don't we do one more question? And uh, there's a bunch of good questions that have been asked. Um, what we we'll do is, since we're going to run out of time to answer all of them, uh, is uh, answer these uh, on the web, and we'll uh, find a place to post answers to questions uh, on the web so that we can get to them. There's a bunch of good ones. In particular, there are several on the theme of how do you actually do revenue projections that are accurate for more disruptive types of ideas? Um, if they're if they're new to the world, there's no data. You know, don't do you run the risk of making wrong decisions? That's a there are about four questions along that theme. That's an excellent question um, that we can answer um, offline on, on the website. I guess just maybe a concluding question, which is what barriers have you seen to doing this? Um, you know, I think um, there there's certainly some barriers associated with. Uh, developing the views that you need, um, and some of them relate to data and how you actually do things like revenue projections for disruptive ideas that can be meaningful and compared in an apple and apple, uh, apples to apples way. Uh, but I'd say a, a bigger uh, issue is once you get to the actual leadership conversation around it, there's sometimes a bit of resistance uh, around you know shining a light on things when you see a project that up, up there that might be put into question and you're there around the table with your colleagues. There's a natural uh, resistance associated with that, but we've actually found that teams, um, it often leads to a change in really the culture of how they govern um, and, and in an exciting way. People um, uh, find that it's, it's such a powerful way to have a clear view of wh whether you're on strategy and what you ought to be doing differently, if anything, that um, once they see the value in it, they overcome those initial, uh, those initial uh, 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 feelings of resistance. So I think we're out of time, Alistair. Do you want to uh, wrap up? For us? Uh, so look, thank you uh, to all of you who joined the webinar. Uh, it was our pleasure to uh, share uh, the thoughts uh, we have on innovation portfolio management. Um, if you found this helpful, we will be sending out a download link to the ebook, um, which uh, is already on the website, but we'll make it easy for you, uh, which goes into much more depth about how you can conduct a strategic portfolio review um, and a reminder that this ebook and the accompanying webinar are just one in a series of uh, ebooks and webinars that will be coming out over the course of the next few months. Uh, in fact, the next one, which is focused on the system itself, uh, will be coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, and we hope that uh, we'll see you all again when we have another chance to talk through the webinar and go into more detail on the 5P model itself. So, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap up here, close down the webinar, uh, and thank you all for joining us. Yep. Thanks, everyone.